we grew a team to help do the release management, the change management, and the configuration of the environment. And then, can you guys hear me? Okay. I'm talking to myself and ranting. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, there's some background noise, but uh, we're able to hear you okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and then we also, as we transition and going towards to current, uh, CM started developing more and more DevOps tools and using DevOps tools and processes. And so now where we are currently, we're um, working with ops and collaborating with other teams to help do the, the deploy to production. So when Drilling Info first hired me, they didn't have a CM person. So they knew that there is a need for change because we constantly had production issues. My first day here, the developer, one of the developers um, actually said, I hate CM people. I just smiled because, <laughs> you know, I'm just here to help things better. Um, but he actually did not want somebody to come in and control and ruin everything. Um, but that's okay. We, we weren't really sure what's the responsibilities of a CM person at Drilling Info. That was not really clear. I didn't really know what was my purpose. Um, and we don't know what info, Drilling Info need and what change they really wanted at that point. We don't know anything, but we know that we need to change something. And so we're in it together. We all agree, the tech team all agree, to improve. So we wanted to first analyze and then integrate to help deliver. So first thing we did was look at the team organization. Everybody was siloed back then. Um, it was all departmental seating and, you know, project teams only meet up like once a week and they work on their own the rest of the week and they come back every week just to kind of catch up. But nobody really knew what other people were doing and the test team was always, you know, got stuck. They were the last stop and pretty much, you know, everybody else was negotiating for them to deploy faster and and test faster so the quality of the changes going out was not at par. We also analyzed the tool sets that we had and the process. You know, we did do continuous uh, continuous integration for trunk and feature branches, which is a good thing. So if you make a change, it goes automatically into the dev environment. Um, however, um, you know, integration was Muted. really difficult. When you have a feature branch coming back into trunk, it took like two weeks to do code reviews. And it was very painful to merge back into trunk and push it out the door. Um, the builds were taking, it was monolithic, so it was like one to two hours to build and run all the unit tests. You know, change management, uh, we could, yeah, we could dig out changes from the, um, the logs, the, the commit logs, but it was not as informative. It was not on an integration level. Um, the configuration was a mess because it would work in dev, but then it won't work in um, production because we're missing all these configurations and there was no dependency management. And communication, again, was everybody was siloed, so it was everybody's doing their own thing. And then, you know, the deploys, we used to do deploys every two weeks, and that was only for bug fixes. It took about five hours every time. And, you know, big releases, like new features and stuff, would be anywhere from nine months to a year and a half, two years. Is that acceptable? I don't think so. So we all realize that what we really need is the speed of delivery. You know, in this day and age, we really need to be on top of it, deliver faster. So with that, um, you know, we need to do something 
different. We need to start building relationships, um, break down to silos, and changing mindsets. Um, the picture over here is actually an intern that we had. Uh, we were having silos between like ops and you know the tech team, the project teams, and so I actually had an intern. So he was making little cupcakes from an easy bake oven. I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's a toy for kids uh, where you could actually bake something. So he's actually in uh, the head of ops office making cupcakes um, and you know breaking down the the silos and you know creating that trust and comfort and then um, so we also by breaking down the silos we we start doing more tech lunches together we go out at, on a weekly basis we do um, group trips to SIGs around Austin SIGs is like special interest groups, so we'll go to like DevOps SIGs um, at various um, companies around Austin and meetups. Um, we're also trying to talk to the business side of the house more so that, you know, we're aligned, more aligned with each other. And with all of this um, was an opportunity for change because we decided to do a new platform. We decided to do a next-gen drilling info. And this gave us an opportunity to um, put everybody together. We started having more de um, dedicated teams where the seating arrangement is like all integrated with everybody from cross-functional um, cross teams. And you know, we started looking at the latest, greatest, innovative tool sets that will help us deliver faster. So it's a lot of collaboration. Um, so this is my CM team. Um, the team, we use Kanban to help manage our workflow. And we do code review to help each other with the cross-training. So in the team, here I am in the middle. Um, I'm the manager, so I help with like the interdepartmental relations, I work with on strategy and processes, and then the guy in the green, Will Sola, is my senior CM. He's an innovator, and his motto is to automate himself out of a job. And the other two is Kevin and and Dave Goodine, and they're. The other two CMs, they're mid-CMs, and they are like the customer-oriented, they write cookbooks, they do support of bills and tools and, and deployment, um, they build relations. So this is my team. Do we have any questions so far? No, no, no questions, uh, Marissa, so far, so you can... Okay, uh, so we're here to serve all these other groups. We have PMOs, GIS, products, DBAs, QAs, products. Oh, I put products twice. Sorry about that. <laughs> Product owners, um, dev and DB dev. So on the left here is your typical CM department in many of the organization, uh, organizations around town. Um, CM usually just manage the, the change the configuration and help coordinate with the releases to to production. Here at Drilling Info, we kind of evolved into more of a DevOps role where we're doing a lot of the deployment tools, the scripts. We do infrastructure as code. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know what that is. That's when we could we use code to pretty much stand up servers from bare metal to a running server. And we help with the development of monitor, um, you know, stuff, calls to run scope for monitoring, production, and any of the environments actually. We do cloud development, continuous delivery, and we do, we also do production support for apps because we're so involved with the project teams. Okay, so my team actually asked me this. 
why? Why do we want to take on more? You know, that's a lot more than a typical CM group. Why do we want to be on call for production support for apps? You know, why do we have to do monitoring? Well, it's easy. We're all in together. We want to, you know, speed up the delivery process. We want to, you know, help eliminate the gates and try to streamline the delivery life cycle. You know, we need more faster and more reliable delivery schedule. And, you know, plus it's cheaper to catch bugs sooner than later. You know, so if you have a project that's like two years by the time we put it out into production, the developer already forgotten how they developed it and, and it's harder to, to fix bugs. Um, and also, you know, getting customer feedback sooner than later is, is also a great thing. So this is what we did. Um, we changed our tool, sh to tool chain, sorry. So for communication, we were using our personal Yahoo account before. But now we have a central, um, you know, communication tool, which is called HipChat. It is great. It is, um, you know, it has a lot of, you know, we integrated with a lot of our technology stack such as Jenkins and RunScope for monitoring. And, you know, um, we also use ChatOps, which is Hubot. We have Hubot living in HipChat. So Hubot, um, his name is Sparky Sanchez. Uh, Sparky helps us with, like, the deploy, kicking off deploys, kicking off automation, all within HipChat. So HipChat was a great, great transition for us. Um, we transitioned from Excel before we were using an Excel spreadsheet to help manage our projects and now um, we are using Rally which is an agile project management tool and that was a little bit of um, a learning curve for us because it was a big change. Doing stand-ups was a big change um, like daily stand-ups and then you know it was kind of hard at first to do the setup so that um, you know we could have accurate reporting. So Rally came in and helped us, and now every single project at Drilling Info is using Rally to help track. So we also moved from Subversion to GitHub. GitHub was really easy. There's a lot of documentation already online, um, you know, and it's very portable, and you could just, you know, do easy code reviews. And so um, that's actually also integrated with HipChat, by the way. So if you have a pull request, we could get a HipChat message that something's ready to review. We're also still using um, our CI server is still Mr. Jenkins. Um, he's pretty stable and and we'll probably still continue to use Jenkins for a while. Um, we're still using Nexus for our artifact management tool. And we didn't really have anything for configuration management. Um, you know, we now use Chef, which is our configuration management tool. Like I said before, um, you know, we could use code to configure from bare metal to a running server. It was very beneficial. Before, it used to take like, you know, two months for ops to help us build a server. Now we could, you know, do things on our own. We as in the project team. Um, and but it was a huge learning curve for the devs and for a lot of team members actually. And um, the hard thing with Chef is that we really didn't have a drilling info process down. It was just kind of here you go and let's run with it. 
And so there was not a lot of expectation, you know, it was not clearly defined. So who owns what, who does what was still, you know, a hard thing for us with Chef. We started using AWS, Amazon Web Services, um, to help manage our servers out in the cloud. Um, you know, we are still using the data center for some of our stuff, but all of the new stuff is now in AWS. Um, there was no implementation issues. Um, we just need to be very conscious of costs. And before, we didn't really have anything for monitoring um, all of our backend services and, you know, our apps, and now we have run scope and we also have another tool called Uptime. And our latest addition is Docker. Um, Docker is great, is, you know, being able to be more portable with the changes and having it all contained um, was great and is very cost savings because it would cost less in, in AWS. So... Can we take one question before you move off from the tools page? Yeah. So in your, in your one of the pages, the first page on the tool chain, you showed uh, tools like um, HipChat and um, Rally. So are these the same tools which are used by the rest of the engineering organization? Uh, for uh, example, development and QA teams, they're using HipChat as well as Rally, of course. Yes. Right. Ops, QA, um, project managers, um, the platform guys, everybody's on it. Even GIS. We do our deployments from HipChat. Right, right. And we're all right. using the same tools. We're all using GitHub. We're all using Rally. Okay, great. Thanks. And that was a, a, a good move, too, because before, everybody was kind of doing their own thing with different tool sets. So that was a good question. So maybe one other clarification on the tools um, you can provide. So where did the initiative to move to common tool set come from, from the CM team or somewhere outside of the CM or any other part of the organization? How did the initiative to get to a shared same set of tool set about. I think it's a collaboration of the whole team, like the whole tech team. Because with stand-ups come a lot of communication. When we meet every day, we talk about, we we'll always constant, um, continuously try to improve our process and, you know, identify what's happening and what are some of the pain points and try to resolve it. And I think when, uh, the platform director actually introduced HipChat to us and slowly each team just started using it and now we're all on it. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. so, um, so now that we have all the tool sets, a new platform, you know, some of the stuff in place, um, we have to deliver. So we you know, pretty much try to do, we as in CM, try to like set up so that, you know, a lot of the developers and testers could do, you know, self-serving stuff. They could self-service themselves and then um, we could focus on deployment process and deployment tools and do more DevOps stuff. So, you know, we created something like Jenkins Job Builder, which you know, could create, developers could go and create or modify Jenkins job that are checked into Git. So we could also reproduce, if something goes wrong with the Jenkins server, we could stand it up quickly because everything is saved in Git. Um, and pull request builder, so if you have a pull request, you submit a pull request, a team member submits a pull request, it would automatically build. Um, before even, you know, doing the code review. So you know that at least it's built, you know, it's able to build. Um, you know, we have this thing that we call a CI monkey, continuous integration monkey. This is something that our senior CM person created, which would 
if you create if you have, if you're a developer um, working on a new repo, um, guess what? This little monkey walks through, creeps through um, Git, and and see if there's a new repo. If there's a new repo, it lays down the build framework for you and creates YAML files so that you could use it for your build. Um, we also, like I said earlier, have Sparky Sanchez, which is our little Hubot to help with the deploys and automation. So um, anybody could use Sparky. Anybody could, you know, um, could could ask questions from Sparky. We we're also like focusing on continuous delivery to dev, so that's set up so we don't have to worry about bills and tools for them. Um, and then we started focusing uh, around the usage of AWS and making sure that you know there's management around there so that we could re reduce some of the costs. And the big thing was the feature gates. Um, this gives us the capability to deploy to production without exposing the new features and until the business side of the house uh, you know is ready for us to expose the, the new features. But so let's take one quick clarification um, question that just came in uh, on this page. So the self-service is it in existence or is this a future kind of a goal? This is existing, yes. Right. This is in the past um, two years we've been kind of working our way up to like having everything kind of like self-service. Thanks. Okay. So with all these improvements, there's still challenges, you know. We, we're continuously trying to break up silos. I mean, to this day, there's, there's all sorts of silos, right, but we just have to try to work at it and build relations and try to talk through some of the stuff. Um, you know, with all the new tools that came in, development was having some issues because their their main purpose is to produce features. But we were actually introducing all these tool sets. Um, all these tools that are kind of complicated, like, you know, Chef and Docker and all these things, is, is they have to stop and they have to try to learn it. And there was like, you know, issues with, hey, I only create a server once a quarter. And every time I create a new server, the process for Chef changed. The, you know, the, the, the way we deploy change and so it makes it really difficult for the development team so you know it's kind of stopping the speed of development and you know on the other side of speed we were delivering quickly with all these tools we were actually um, you know deploying every week the latest greatest every week and um, you know we we had to like quickly align with the business side because we were just exposing, exposing, exposing too much too quickly. Um, customers' adoption was an issue. Um, you know, also we were deploying every week, but our dev teams were doing the project teams were doing two week sprints. So in the middle of their sprints, they had to like stop. Wait, we have to tag, we have to make sure everything is stabilized, so that was actually slowing them down too. And um, communication is always a challenge, right? Just between the tech teams, between the business side and the tech team, and communication from our company to the customers. Um, what are we doing about it? HipChat was, for the tech team, was helpful. Um, from the business side, we started, I believe, a year and a half ago or two years ago, we started um, the Business Ready Group, which is a representative from each of the groups in, in, um, at Drilling Info. So every week we, we meet up, we talk about what's coming down the pipe, what are some of the requirements, how, to, how do we launch, what to enable, what to not enable. Um, and so that was really helpful. 
um, and the com company communication to customers. We now have a go-to-market plan. So we work closely, the tech team work closely with the marketing and sales team to help with the market um, go-to-market plan. And lastly, costs, like I, I've been saying a couple of times now, AWS was a great example. Like, it was so easy to create a node in AWS that we were just spinning off nodes left and right, you know, and not managing it well. It was not like, if we're not using it, we still kept it around. We didn't know. We forgot about it. And so, you know, the size of the node was, was important. Um, you know, because if you get like a huge node, it would cost more, and even the generation of the nodes. So all of that's now being managed, and and you know, make sure we look at all these things for costs. So I'm going to transition a little bit and walk through um, our deploy process progression as we created this new platform. Originally, we have like four environments, dev, test, sage, and prod. And what we did was we had configuration for each one of the environments. And so every time there's a deploy, you know, developers have to work with CM, and CM had to write down, hand write um, all of the changes um, from dev environment into a deploy ticket. And then IT would have to like use that change, take that change, and put it into the production environment because we were not allowed to touch production environment, only um, ops or IT. I use that as the same. Um, and so we had a lot of issues. Um, our first deploy with the new platform was January 2012. We were back then. We were doing inline upgrades only. So after so many upgrades, the servers would go into a bad state. Um, so we would have to either restart or rebuild that server. Um, there was downtime due to issues because we were fat fingering the changes because um, everything was manual. And at that time, the CM's role was just coordinating the deploy. We were doing release management for them, for the company. So after two years of that, um, you know, the light bulb went out for my senior CM. He was having a beer or two on, on his vacation and he was just like, you know what, why don't we do red-black deploys? Um, that's kind of the concept. That's, that's the technique that um, Netflix uses. Um, they, they do red-black deploys. Um, I don't know about now, but back then. Um, so this would resolve the unstable server issues that we have with inline upgrades. Um, this will also give an opportunity to catch any issues in pre-prod, pre-production, or you know, the environment before going into production. Um, so the testers have a chance to test, and then, um, you know, we could we we just start CM started development of um, CloudFormation to help orchestrate the servers instead of like before we were doing one server upgrade at a time. So using Knife and Chef, so that was taking a long time. Now we're doing CloudFormation, which would do several servers at a time. And so, however, the configuration part was still manual at that point. Um, our deploy process consists of like standing up a red environment with the latest change, and while the black one is still in production. So you have A, B, red, black, pink, purple. You know, you have two environments. Um, we move all of the, you know, during the day of the deploy, we would just then move all of the servers in the red environments into the production load balancer. It sounds good. Well, we still have issues. There were still manual updates, right, to the production environments. 
um, there was a whole bunch of confusion. Is it red or is it black? What, which one do we have? Which environment is good? So we were ending up like uploading the wrong environment file to, um, you know, to production. So the ploys were failing and production outages um, were happening during the prep of the pre-prod environment. So there was frustration in the DevOps aisle at work here. It was at all, at, at, you know, it was really, really high. The frustration was really high. The developers were screaming. They were like, you're doing it all wrong, but don't want to be involved, so I don't know. I don't care, but you're doing it wrong. Um, CM was kind of, you know, disappointed, but yet we can't really debug because we have no access to production environment. The ops team, they felt like a deploy monkey. They don't know the app. They're not too involved with the project. And so they always push the new guy to do all of the deploys. So there was a lot. It was chaotic. Hey, Marissa, that, can we take a quick uh, pause and answer one question, which will help um, in the uh, topic you're covering? So can you give a bit of a uh, con um, uh, indication of the complexity and the size of the teams in terms of how many product teams or project teams was the CM team supporting? So everything you're telling right now, it will be, be in better context for the audience. I'm trying to remember back then, I think it was last year, I would say maybe, I want to say four or five project teams. Okay. And that's not including legacy um, deploys. Okay. And then, um, you know, the dev teams, we have dev teams all over the world. Um, we have some in India, Costa Rica, um, you know, uh, Ukraine and, and et cetera in America. Mexico, right? So they're all over. So it's worldwide. We'll come back, uh, we'll come back at the end and take. Uh, I, I parked this question on the distributed team. We'll take that question again. But in terms of complexity, that your CM team was day to day managing using four or five product slash project teams. So the complexity is like uh, when project teams are standing up new. They have to, you know, well deploy a new service service or, um, you know, densities between the different teams such as dev or database dev, um, you know, there's a lot of complexity in the deploy process itself. So dealing not only with the, the tools, the day-to-day -day project work, but also dependencies and, and then now is like the whole deploy process was, was complex. Great, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that did. Thanks. Okay. However, you know, there was benefits with moving to this, you know, red black deploy because now we could actually re recreate servers. You know, we're able to test before it goes out into production, um, and we minimize the downtime and deploy time. At that time, CM's role was still change management, release coordination, but now we added deploy automation. Okay. So here's where we are now. <laughs> so now all of the configuration, all of the attributes um, that are, are the same between dev and test and, you know, pre-production and production, um, you know, because we converted it into a cookbook. And so environment-specific um, attributes changes are pull requests by developers now. So if they need to modify um, an attribute, they would just submit a change and then CM would merge it and then it will automatically converge into the dev environment and then it will go to you know the next environment and so on and so on and out to production so it's more managed manageable um, scripts and um, are pulled together uh, script there are scripts to pull all the attributes together to create like dev to create pre-prod to create production so it's more a little bit more automated. Um, so our deploy process would um, 
would look like, you know, we deploy a new configuration is just updating the version of the cookbook up here, see right here, um, you know, stand up a new environment with the latest changes while the current environment is still in production. So it's still red, black, right? Um, upload new environment to production after the go, no go. So we have like a, a gate to say, hey, is everybody ready? Everybody's good with it. All the teams are good with it. We have a go, no go now. And, um, and then what we do during the time of the deploy is still move all of the servers into the production load balancer. So there's still an issue of there's still manual steps, but you know, it's a lot better, it's more automated. Um, you know, you could still test in pre-prod and, and there's less chance of breaking production. So we are minimizing the downtime and, and deploy time. So where we are currently is that CM have access to production and we do deployments to production for AWS. Um, and we collaborate with IT to, um, to deploy, you know, all the VMs in the data center. Any questions on, on that? Uh, no, no questions on that topic. Yeah, so it's a, it's a progression. It took a, a couple of years, but we're still constantly improving. So, you know, it's been quite a trip for me here at Drilling Info, you know, to see all the changes and I'm very proud to see we're moving the right direction. You know, we have a DevOps mentality here and, you know, we're agile, um, you know, it, it gives us faster delivery to deploy um, development, to tests and, you know, to production, to customers' hands, right? You get faster customer feedback. Um, and the collaboration now within the project teams, you know, led to innovative ideas, solving problems together faster as a team. You know, there's better communication and cross-functional skills. So, Marissa, let's take one clarification question that I just uh, come in. Um, you, when you do the deploys to dev or test, uh, do you do it every build or once a day or how do you do that? How often? Um, so for development is continuous integration, continuous delivery, which means every check-in, you know, after if the build is successful, it deploys to the dev environment. But for tests, we don't we now call it pre-prod actually, um, is we're not quite there yet. I want to move it to the next level where we have um, once a night, this is kind of my vision, once a night uh, we do the build and then we run all of the regression tests, we run all of the tests, um, performance tests, everything. If everything is good, then it goes, pushes to, te um, to test or what we call pre-prod now. Um, okay you know, every day. So we're not quite there yet. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So just a recap of all the changes um, for our tool set. You know, with Chef, we're able to, you know, manage configuration ac across hundreds of servers, right? With GitHub, you know, it's very portable. Uh, you could develop anywhere at the beach, in India, you know, anywhere. Um, and it's a lot easier for code review. Um, AWS, you know, you could stand up a new environment in less than an hour now. Um, you know, run scope, monitoring, you know, all the different environments that we have. Um, and HipChat is our central communication. And Hubot, Sparky Sanchez integrates um, with other tools and help us with deployments and test automation. And Docker saves us a lot of money and all the changes are contained. So this is where we are now, Ops and CM, working together to deploy to production.
and um, you know CM is doing more DevOps and supporting the project teams, the tech team. So what's next? Um, constantly trying to be more proactive instead of reactive. Um, obviously, AWS management. If we do AWS, or what's the cheapest way to to keep production up and and still be agile and fast? So it might not be AWS in the future. We're not sure, but um, using Docker definitely. We wanted to expand our Docker ecosystem. Um, we're still currently using Chef, but Chef might be going away in the future as we use more and more of the Docker ecosystem, like Compose, Create, Swarm, or Orca. Orca. Um, and hopefully we could get to continuous delivery this um, next year. And overall, just having the company be more agile, you know, like from the business side to the tech side, you know, the CEO, COO, and and the whole company. <laughs> and that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, so there are a number of questions we have teed up here. So uh, let me encourage uh, all the, the attendees uh, that if you have more questions, just keep sending this way. And while you're doing that, Marissa, if I can just take a few seconds um, uh, introduce the if you can advance your pages. Uh, sure. Page. Sure. I'm going to go on mute. But, yeah. So, uh, uh, maybe go to the next page. So, but, uh, in the audience, as you guys are thinking about the questions and reflecting on the topic that Marissa just covered, let me take a minute or less and introduce Synergy for those who don't know us. So, we are a uh, so agile product development company. We work uh, almost exclusively with uh, mid-sized technology companies, uh, just like Drilling Info is a good example. We work with them, but all of our clients are venture-backed companies, and and we, for each client, we have a dedicated assigned team to work with that client, so they get to learn the the agile environment and the specifics of agile practice with that uh, client team, and become an integral part of a clients as an ex extension of the in-house team. And through that process and the expertise we bring to the table, we are able to help our clients reduce the risk and this and the reduce the speed of delivering uh, following agile practices and DevOps and so on, as you just heard. And we have a dual shore operation. We have a team in India and a team in US. And through that combination, we are able to consistently reduce uh, the software development costs for our clients, uh, often to the order of 50% or more at times. Uh, and while doing all that, we still uh, provide a lot of flexibility, long-term flexibility to our clients that they can convert a team that is working with them at Synergy into a captive team whenever they feel like it. So we essentially help our clients accelerate their product road technology roadmap in a flexible and a, a capital efficient way. Uh, if you can Marissa, advance to the next page, I'll do a quick glimpse of Synergy uh, clients. Um, and that page a lot of logos, so it takes a few minutes, seconds to refresh, but this is just to give you an idea. Most of the clients you might recognize are um, venture-backed, uh, high-growth companies. So with that, let's come back to the topic at hand um, of our configuration management transitioning into DevOps Agile world. And let's take a few questions, uh, Marissa. Uh, let me review. We have a number of questions, and I'll pick those questions that um, uh, kind of help a broader in so one first question I want to uh, ask you is uh, you would you mentioned in the beginning that you had organizational functional siloed organization so did you as a company make any significant organizational changes to break down those functional silos to be able to effectively moved into move into a more of an agile environment with DevOps and so on yes we did a lot um, we actually changed the way we configured our cubes so it's more collaborative um, I don't know how to explain it so it's more like an open area and everybody sits in one big cube but then it's kind of you still have a little bit of privacy um, so each project team is kind of together where we have like a tester a de um, the devs um, test dev um, um, you know, sometimes an IT person and 
some point we had like a BA sitting in there in the main um, project area. And then um, we also try to increase the culture. Doing standouts was, was huge. From doing the weekly um, project um, sync up to every day we meet up, we know, we see using the rally board, we see it's visual, so we see who's working on what, and we could like discuss what's happening. So that broke down a lot of the silos also. Um, we still have issues, um, don't get me wrong, we still have, you know, just due to the business, you know, there's, there's always something that's happening. So we do still have some silos that we're still working on. Very helpful. Anything else to add? Uh, we touched, you touched on the topic of the geographic complexity. You have uh, teams across time zones and across geographies, Marissa, in your organization. So anything you guys feel uh, uh, that you did which has helped make this transition uh, better? Um, given the geographic complexity you guys have had? Yes. Um, so we're, we're moving quite fast, and things are always changing, um, hence Agile, right? Uh, so we do stand-ups with the offshore teams. We have a tech lead for each of, um, like a representative for each of the offshore teams, and then we come back and collaborate with the main um, team here, like the big project here. So that was helpful because, you know, the, because of the time difference, it was kind of hard to just get everybody um, aligned at the same time. So by having representatives, that was helpful and using a big rally board. So our, we're moving to Kanban for this project, but our board have swim lanes. So our swim lanes, um, I wonder, I don't want to show it right now, but um, so our swim lane would be like, okay, this is the work from, you know, offshore A, this is the work from offshore B, this is the work from the Austin team. Um, so we see it in one board and that using tools to help us, you know, using WebEx, using um, lunch and learns that are, you know, recorded. Um, we do hip chat. I keep on going back to hip chat, but hip chat is, you know, it has history, so you could look through and, you know, if you're sleeping and you wake up and you come into work and you see what's going on um, in in the different rooms, you can still catch up. So we use a lot of the tooling to help us collaborate. Excellent, thank you. Another one is a question around any formal training that you had um, your CM team that you showed the picture in the beginning. Did you have any of the team members or the entire team go through any formal training to be more effective in this transition? Um, we had chef training, but pretty much because we're hands-on and we want to help. Um, you know, we're pretty hands-on and, and just working with chef all day, you know, the, all day, every day, it, it helps. And so we just kind of caught on. And um, my team is pretty vocal. <laughs> um, so, you know, I lead the, the team to be able to express themselves and to, um, you know, collaborate and talk. So they're kind of loud in that aisle that, you know, where the CM team is sitting. So people tend to listen and whoever sits around there tend to pick up a lot too. So formal training, I think probably the only one we did was uh, with Chef, but I think it was more hands-on training and working with developers and platform guys. Great, thanks. Let's take one other clarification. I know you did answer this question on Teams, but since this has come slightly differently, I'm going to read this question off, Marissa. Um, so how many teams do you have doing daily stand-up meetings and how stable are they? Are all three CM engineers in one team? No, not all CM engineers are on um, one team. So how many stand-ups? There's a lot of stand-ups. Um, there's a handful. I would say maybe seven or eight. 
and um, we right now we have one major project which we have one CM team representing that project but then there's like little projects that we have um, different CM engineers representing we try to have one for each um, mm -hmm. app project projects um, but there are some like database um, projects that we're not involved in. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me see what you're doing. Yeah. Let me go um, clarify a little bit more. Even though they're the representative, that person's the representative, doesn't mean that this person would have to do all of the work for the big project. Um, this person would then create a card on our Kanban board and then we just use the pool system so whoever's available or have the most knowledge in that area could pull the card and help. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Uh, let's take a tools question um, in, in this queue for a while. So uh, the question is, in, in, in hindsight, do you think implementing and investing in Docker would be better than implementing Chef and then going to Docker? Oh, Docker is 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 better. Um, it's easier. If you do it over again. If you do it over over again, I guess the question: Would you go straight to Docker, or would you first implement? Straight Chef to Docker. Then? Straight to Docker. Yeah, that makes sense. It was easier. Um, the learning curve is smaller, and it has more acceptance. Okay. Chef was good. It was a good step. At back then, there was no Docker. Yeah, that makes sense. You're right. Docker is relatively new. You're right. Okay. Uh, uh, on training again, the, uh, anything specific outside of, I guess, DevOps uh, training, any other specific Agile training that you found useful for your teams as they went through this transition? What we do a lot was go to meetups, go to, um, you know, the special interest group lunches, and, you know, we focus around um, DevOps SIGs and DevOps um, meetups and what helped us the most was talking to other um, DevOps-ish person, people. And um, you know, there's a conference, um, especially for, the, for those in Austin, there's a DevOps conference that is a must-go every year we go, the whole team goes and it's not even that expensive. And that just shows, um, it would show like the latest technology, the latest features in some of the tools that we have and collaborating with other people of how they use um, Chef, how they use Docker, how do they, what's the process and stuff. That's the number one thing. But well, can you uh, advance to next page in here so we can uh, have people also look, look at the next upcoming webinar while I finish up the questions here. Uh, yeah, good. Thank you. So just for audience, this is our next webinar teed up for January as you uh, come back from the holidays and all that. So this is the topic of um, do in Agile, do we need managers? This is a good, uh, interesting topic for next month. But let me see if there's any more unanswered question on this topic of transition from CM DevOps world. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the cloud independent uh, choice or getting too tight to AWS versus exploring other cloud options? Did you guys consider that and how do, what do you think about that? Um, we actually saw a demo of um, another tool. I, don't, I forgot the name right now. But, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to use OpenStack or Rackspace or, um, you know, Google by the minute, um, you know, there's all these, all these opportunities to use all these different technologies, um, all these different companies, um, but we really have to take a step back and, and kind of look at what, what's being used, how your, all of your servers, what's being used, how it's being used, how often, um, you know, probably is a, is a big project to do that. Um, but you have to kind of see what's best for your company for this particular, uh, let's say the app must be running at all times. So you might want it to have, you know, um, 
you know, a AWS or something. It just depends on the situation. But you have to analyze what you have and how it's being used. Right. Great. Right. Thanks. Um, I think that pretty much covers all the direct questions. There's one straggling question you did cover it, but let me bring it up. Um, maybe this is the last one. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that um, you guys in CM did production support. So can you shed some more light on why production support ended up in CM and is and 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 um, what's the advice to other companies? Uh, in similar situation to have, should they have production support as a part of the CM scope of responsibility? So I'm in a transition of actually moving my team to DevOps, like overall DevOps as a team team name and roles and responsibilities. Um, we are very engaged with what's happening in in the projects. So on the app level, we're able to help because we do all the deploys and stuff, um, we, we're able to help if there's issues with production. And so from the ops side of things, they help out with um, production support too, but it's more on like a system level. Um, so they'll look at networking and network and storage and you know, all the, they'll monitor all of the system level um, things and then we kind of transition to more app support. So it doesn't mean that we have to actually fix the code if there's issues, but kind of identify what's going on and being involved with um, the other teams, collaborating and say, hey, wait, hey, this is the, um, the developer. This developer developed this feature, so let's get him in. So we, we're actually able to identify who can help us the most when we have production issues. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much, Marissa. We have run out of time to schedule for this webinar. Uh, happy holidays to all of you attended, and uh, thanks again, Marissa, for joining us right in um, uh, almost to the, towards the start of holidays. We'll see you all next month uh, when you're bright and re-energized for 2016 in this webinar called If We Are Agile, Why Do We Need Managers? Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity.